Okay, so welcome to this next video in the playlist on experimental techniques. This is the first video in which we're going to discuss uh, the Human Genome Project. So that's the topic for the ne this video and the uh, next upcoming videos. So the Human Genome Project. And in this video, we're specifically going to look at genome libraries. So we're going to start the story of what happened in the Human Genome Project. Uh, we're going to start by looking at genome libraries. Then we'll look at the way in which the genome was actually sequenced in the Human Genome Project, which is basically they used the Sanger method, a method uh, invented what, um, by... Um, well, the scientist Sanger in uh, the 1970s, they used this method, of, well, a slightly modified version of the original version, but essentially the same thing, and it took ages, basically. This was a project that was started in 1990 and was finally completed in 2003, so it took 13 years. Now, what were they actually trying to do? They were trying to sequence the entire human genome. So let me just explain to you what the entire human genome is, because it's more subtle than you might think. So, in a cell, let's say this is a somatic cell in the body, then let's say this is the nucleus of that somatic cell, then in this nucleus there are 46 chromosomes. So you might think, okay, so you just want to sequence all 46 of those chromosomes, that's the human genome. No. Because 46, you do have 46 chromosomes, but they're in pairs, they're in homologous pairs, there are actually only 23 uh, distinct um, chromosomes which have distinct genes on them. Well, actually, maybe you could argue 24, because the X and the Y chromosomes are separate. Um, but the point is that we don't need to uh, sequence chromosome 1 twice, uh, because every person will have two chromosome 1s in, so let's draw chromosome 1 here. Sorry about the sirens outside. Uh, here's chromosome 1, and basically everyone will have two copies of chromosome 1. One which they inherited from their father, so let's say paternal here, and one which they inherited from their mother, maternal here. And again, the same for chromosome 2, so you'll have two copies of chromosome 2 here as well, and then it will go all the way down, and then chromosome 23 is a little bit more complicated because if you're a fe if you're a girl, you're going to have two chromosome X's, okay? And if you're a boy, you'll have a chromosome X and then a tiny little thing called a chromosome Y. Okay, right, so there's our chromosome X and our chromosome Y. Right, so when I say we're going to sequence the human genome, what I mean is we're going to sequence all of these chromosomes from 1, 2, 3, all the way up to 22, and we're just going to sequence those once. And then I also would like to know what's on chromosome Y and what's on chromosome X. So, this is the objective then. To sequence the, um, to find the organic base sequence of all the chromosomes from chromosome 1 to 22. And, well, well, we'll leave out the sex chromosomes initially. We would like to know those as well. In fact, okay, well, we want to know the, chroma the DNA sequence of chromosome 1 to 22, and then also the chromosome, uh, well, the DNA sequence of chromosome X and chromosome Y, basically. Right. So, that's the objective for the Human Genome Project. It took 13 years, and it cost around $3 billion, basically. Now... Uh, this is a, a scary fact. This is the reality of how far we've come along. You can now have your genome sequenced. You can now pay and have your genome sequenced. And it will not cost $3 billion. Instead, it costs nearly, we've almost got it down to around $1,000. So, technology has in advanced hugely, basically. In, in the last, you know, in my lifetime, 
it has gone from costing three billion dollars to sequence someone's genome to costing a thousand dollars or nearly we're nearly at a thousand dollars we're not quite there yet it's under ten thousand dollars though now so you can pay and have your entire genome sequenced and there are websites that you can find online uh, where you can have uh, your genome sequenced I think generally they don't sequence the entire genome they sequence only the exons i.e. the coding genes rather than all the introns in between um, and it's quite scary because there's very little regulation on these sorts of sites and they will send you um, your exome back they will send you your sequenced exons back and they will also tell you uh, what diseases you're likely to die of in this and it's this it's quite scary that there's no modulation on this at all and I wouldn't advise that you go and have this done unless you want to turn into a hypochondriac Okay, uh, so, uh, the Human Genome Project then. Why uh, did it take three billion dollars? Why now can we do it for a thousand dollars? So, in order to understand that question, what has changed basically, we need to look at how the Human Genome Project worked. What did they do? So we're going to firstly discuss genome libraries, which is something, an essential part of uh, the Human Genome Project. We're then going to discuss the way they actually sequenced the DNA, so uh, Sanger sequencing or capillary sequencing, whatever you want to call it. And then we're going to discuss new generation sequencing, which is the new way in which we actually sequence genomes and the reason we can now do it for under $10,000 and approaching $1,000. Okay. Right, so, firstly, um, we uh, often, instead of doing it, um, well, firstly we need to get the DNA we want, to, um, we want to sequence. So often the way that they do it, in order to avoid the degeneracy, i.e. the two chromosome ones, the two chromosome twos, what a good starting point would be is to get a sperm cell. Okay, so let's say we have a sperm cell here. So this would be a good starting point. So let's say this is a sperm cell, it, and basically the sperm has a nucleus which only contains one copy of each chromosome, so it only contains 23 chromosomes, but basically the sperm is what, what is known as haploid, and indeed the egg cell will also be haploid, whereas normal somatic cells of the body are what are known as diploid which means that they have two copies, die for two copies of each homologous chromosome, okay? So, uh, a good starting point to get rid of this degeneracy, to get rid of the fact that we have two copies of each um, homologous chromosome would be to use a sperm cell. Now, sperm cells are going to have a single copy of all the chromosomes from 1 to 22, and then what's the 23rd chromosome going to be? Uh, well, uh, it's going to be either X or Y. So, if we uh, get different sperm cells, basically, these sperm cells will either have an X chromosome in, or they'll have a Y chromosome in. So, uh, by sampling different sperm cells, we can also get our hands on uh, both the X and the Y chromosome. Okay, so, uh, firstly, what we need to do then is extract the DNA from the sperm cell. And for the basis of this video, let's just say that this sperm cell happened to have the X chromosome. So the X chromosome is massive compared to the Y chromosome. So we'll start off with that one. So we'll focus our attention on X and we'll sequence Y later, okay? So we'll go for trying to sequence all the chromosomes from 1 to 22 and also the X chromosome. Right. Okay, so firstly what we need to do is get our DNA out of the cell. So now what we have is chromosome 1 here, uh, then we'll have chromosome 2, so I'll label these 1, 2, and then it goes all the way down to X chromosome or chromosome 23 if you want to call it that. So we've got all of these um, chromosomes now, we've extracted them from our sperm cell, what do we do now? Do we just begin the Sanger sequencing method on these chromosomes? Well, it might seem like an idea. The problem is Sanger sequencing is not going to work on these massive great chromosomes. And I should actually say, uh, the, uh, number of chroma uh, the number of base pairs that you have overall in this massive great 23 chromosomes, uh, you will have 3 billion base pairs, 3 billion organic bases 
in all of these 23 chromosomes. That's approximately how many you had. So it cost a dollar a base pair, the Human Genome Project, effectively. Three billion base pairs. Okay, so that really emphasizes, you know, that if you divide that by 23, and they're not evenly distributed. Chromosome 1 is massive compared to some of the others, so it will have much more than 3 billion divided by 23, whatever that number is, base pairs. But the point is, these chromosomes are massive. They're over 100 million uh, base pairs long, some of them. You can't sequence in 100 base pair, um, uh, 100 base pair DNA uh, strand, basically. So, what has to happen is you have to break up the DNA strand, okay? So that's the first thing that you do. You chop it up into loads of pieces. So you release restriction endonucleases on your DNA. Okay, so let me explain to you what a restriction endonuclease is. So a restriction endonuclease is an enzyme capable of cutting DNA. Any sort of enzyme with nuclease on the end here means that it's going to cut DNA. Let me just explain to you then what an endonuclease is. So in order to explain what an endonuclease is, let me just draw a bit of um, DNA here. So, just to revise the structure of DNA, because we're going to need this a lot later. Um, here is the phospholipid backbone. So we've got uh, a phosphate group, which I'm just denoting as a circle, and then a uh, ribose sugar, which I'm denoting as a pentagon. Then you'll have another phosphate group coming off the third carbon of this ribose. And I should probably denote the fifth carbon of ribose by putting a corner in, which I didn't do for this one, but never mind. Okay. And then it will continue on like this. Right. And then each of these riboses off the first carbon will have some organic base. So let's say this was adenine and this was cytosine over here. Right. Okay. So, um, basically... Uh, oh, actually, maybe, I'll, uh, maybe I should have... Uh, uh, let's say it goes on and on, basically. It's right in the middle. Okay, so basically, restriction endonuclease. It's endonuclease. What does endonuclease mean? It means it can cut uh, this uh, bond between the hydroxyl group of the third carbon and the phosphate group, basically. So it can cut this bond, and it doesn't just do it on the edge of DNA. So let me explain what I mean by that. I'll have to draw some pictures where I'm just drawing lines like this. So, if we have DNA here, either uh, an enzyme which breaks down DNA, a nuclease, could cut nucleotides off from the end. So it could go to the final nucleotide over here and cut that one off and then continue on, i.e. it could go to the next one then and chop that one off and chop the next one off and keep chopping like this and working its way through the DNA to destroy it. That would be what's known as an exonuclease. If you cut off the externalmost um, nucleotide, then you are what are known as an exonuclease. Whereas, an endonuclease basically will come along to a DNA strand and it will cut this bond between the phosphate group and the third carbon, but it will do it in mid-strand, basically. It doesn't just chop this bond off at the right end and then release the nucleotide like an exonuclease. It will come right into the middle of the DNA strand and cut the bond in the middle, and that's what is meant by an endonuclease. Now, the reason they're called restriction endonucleases is uh, that they were found in bacteria, basically, and their role in bacteria was to protect the bacteria against viral DNA, i.e. to restrict uh, viral, well, restrict viral DNA's access to the bacterium. So let me just explain this. So let's say we have a bacterium here. And for the basis of this, we can think of Escherichia coli as an example of a, a bacterium. So this is an Escherichia coli bacterium. And basically, uh, bacteria, like humans, are very susceptible to viruses. So let's say here comes a bacteriophage, which is a fancy name for a virus that affects um, bacteria. And um, basically, uh, they have this sort of war of the worlds, a war of the worlds sort of scary monster structure. So when you see viruses that look like this, this is the, these are bacteriophage viruses. They're not viruses that affect humans. Okay, so this is a bacteriophage. Okay, and basically what it does 
is when it's going to infect the Escherichia coli, it will inject its viral DNA into the E. coli cell. And usually what would happen is that viral DNA is then transcribed and translated, and the bacterium then produces uh, loads of the viral proteins. Uh, for instance, it will produce proteins that will make more virus particles. Okay, so uh, the purpose of restriction endonucleases is that the bacterium can make uh, enzymes which will chop up the viral DNA. Now, how do they target specifically the viral DNA? How come they don't chop up the bacteria's own DNA? Well, the reason is they will only chop the DNA at certain recognition sites, basically. And these recognition sites will be sites that are uh, specifically not included in the bacteria's own DNA. So the bacteria will know that it never uses this certain combination of organic bases, and it'll make up, uh, it basically, well, it doesn't know this, and it doesn't make up, but natural selection means that only a bacterium that makes an enzyme that... Um, is selective for recognition sites that are not found in the bacteria's own DNA uh, will survive, basically. So these restriction endonucleases recognize sites, um, recognize sequences of organic bases that aren't found in the bacteria's own DNA and which are found in the viral DNA and then start chopping it up. And if you chop up the DNA, it's no longer functional. So this basically is the restriction endonuclease enzyme. Okay, so we'll continue this discussion in the next video. So I'll just finish writing this restriction endonuclease. Okay.